coffee. Coffee now! <laughs> There shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission. One message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, the news program that reports the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. I'm Rick Wiles. Welcome to one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Currency Wars author Jim Rickards will join me later in the program to discuss the Saudi Arabian diplomatic rupture with Barack Obama. And we'll discuss plans for a new global currency and the dethronement of the U.S. dollar as king of the hill. Let's start with this extremely important news story regarding Saudi Arabia. A deepening diplomatic rift between Saudi Arabia and the United States burst open On Tuesday, Secretary of State John Kerry was compelled to publicly admit that Saudi Arabia is furious over Barack Obama's foreign policy in the Middle East. Mr. Kerry held emergency talks in Paris on Monday with Saudi Foreign Minister Prince Saad al-Faisal in an attempt to calm down the crisis. Mr. Kerry told reporters in London that the U.S. acknowledges that the Saudis are disappointed that the U.S. did not attack Syria. Mr. Kerry insisted that the relationship between the two countries is sound. London's Daily Mail, however, reported today that Saudi Arabia has severed its diplomatic relations with the United States. The Wall Street Journal reported yesterday that Saudi intelligence chief Prince Bandar bin Sultan invited Arab diplomats to Jeddah over the weekend to inform them that Saudi Arabia would be making a major shift in its relationship with America. The growing breach deepened uh, when Prince Turkey al-Faisal called Mr. Obama's policies lamentable. He ridiculed Mr. Obama's deal with Syria to destroy its chemical weapons as a charade and blatantly perfidious. Mr. or Prince Bandar reportedly told European diplomats that Saudi Arabia will limit its interaction with the United States. The diplomatic rupture could have a devastating impact on the value of the U.S. dollar. When President Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard in 1971, he and Henry Kissinger negotiated a deal with Saudi Arabia in 1973. The Saudis promised that all oil would be traded in U.S. dollars and that the Saudis would plow excess oil profits into U.S. Treasury bonds to finance the American national deficit. In return, the U.S. promised to militarily defend Saudi Arabia's vast oil fields. Sources say that President Obama refused to guarantee that America would defend Saudi Arabia if an all-out Middle East war erupted during a U.S. attack on Syria. Now, if the Saudis follow through on their threat, it means that the U.S. petrodollar, which has been in place since 1973, ever since the dollar went off the gold standard, it means that the U.S. petrodollar could end very soon, perhaps within months. And that means the value of the U.S. dollar will plunge. The rupture, um, obviously, uh, would have a a major impact on the value of the dollar. Uh, It is is estimated that um, the Saudis 
have invested $690 billion of its foreign currency assets in U.S. Treasuries. Furthermore, the Arab country has hundreds of billions of dollars stored in U.S. banks. Now, is the Saudi-U.S. petrodollar alliance falling apart under Barack Obama? Is Mr. Obama deliberately destroying the U.S. dollar? Is he the human wrecking ball? Has foreign agent Barack Hussein Obama double-crossed his Saudi paymasters? Or is he carrying out a carefully orchestrated drama to set the stage for the Saudis to end the petrodollar and align with China and or Russia in a new world order? Barack Hussein, the wrecking ball, Obama, has certainly made a mess of diplomatic relationships with a lot of U.S. allies. The list of offended allies seems to be growing by the day. It started when he double-crossed Egyptian President Mubarak. Mr. Obama secretly aided the Muslim Brotherhood's takeover of Egypt. After the coup, the Muslim Brotherhood put the long-term American ally, President Mubarak, in prison where he stayed for several years until rescued months ago by his loyal supporters inside the Egyptian army. The Egyptian army finally had enough of Mr. Obama and his Muslim Brotherhood. The Egyptian army overthrew the Brotherhood months ago, and Mr. Obama's name is despised in Cairo. In Libya, the old desert rat, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, was secretly supplying intelligence to the West about al-Qaeda and other Islamic radicals. Al-Qaeda was terrified of Gaddafi. He executed everyone he captured inside his country. The Mac Daddy, however, double-crossed Gaddafi. The U.S.-French NATO alliance bombed his country. Gaddafi eventually got a buck knife jammed up his behind when he was captured. So much for secretly doing business with the West. I have to say, I miss old Gaddafi. He added a lot of color to reporting the news. Do you remember him and his traveling tent and harem of women? They just don't make dictators like that anymore. And what about Israel? Mr. Obama has double-crossed America's longtime Jewish ally, too. you got to give Mr. Obama credit. He doesn't show partiality. He double-crosses the Arabs, and he double-crosses the Jews. He gets them all. He can't help it. He's the Mac Daddy. He's a jive-talking, sh- Chicago street-hustling thug who's never had an honest job in his life. The only thing he knows how to do is mess with people. That's what he does. He messes with people. When he's messing with somebody, he's all smiles. He's in his glory. But you know what happens to somebody that likes to mess with people? Somebody bigger messes with them. And what about the U.S. allies he's angered with his NSA spying? Brazil's president did a first, something that no president or prime minister has ever done. President Dilma Rousseff canceled a state dinner for her in the White House. Why? Because she's really ticked off about the NSA's massive spying on Brazilian communications. The Mac Daddy has insulted the Mexicans, too. The NSA hackers penetrated the computer networks in the office of the Mexican presidency. He angered the French by scooping up volumes of private data by monitoring 70 million phone calls per month in France. Mr. Obama used the NSA to spy on German leaders. The latest news today is that U.S. intelligence agencies tapped the mobile telephone of German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Der Spiegel reported today that Mrs. Merkel called the Mac Daddy to tell him off about eavesdropping on her phone calls. Merkel spokesman Stefan Seibert said in a statement that Mrs. Merkel made it clear to Obama in that phone call that she views such practices as completely unacceptable, 
Merkel said that among close partners such as Germany and the United States, quote, there must not be such surveillance of a head of government's communication. Mr. Cyber said that would be a serious breach of trust. Such practices must be stopped immediately. Mr. Cyber, you're dealing with the Mac Daddy. There is no such thing as trust or ethics. He's a street punk. He's a hustler. He's not going to play by the rules. He makes the rules. Well, the list goes on and on and on of the American allies angered by Barack Hussein Obama, the human wrecking ball who's making a mess of everything. I personally believe he's doing it on purpose. I believe this is his assignment. Destroy the old America. Make way for the new America. And what is that new America? I believe that new America is what the Bible calls Mystery Babylon. And I don't think there's any doubt why the nations will someday be so angry at the United States that they will unite to burn down the harlot. I am increasingly confident that the United States is Mystery Babylon in the Bible. I know that's not the standard teaching of Bible prophecy teachers in this country, but I think time is showing that what they have taught us is wrong. And we have to rethink everything that we've heard about Bible prophecy. We need to throw all those books and DVDs and charts away and have a clean slate and start over. Let's reevaluate everything. No feelings hurt. Nobody's offended. Let's start from scratch. Let's just take a look at what is happening and compare what was being taught for decades in American churches as Bible prophecy. Is it lining up? Does it make sense? And I say no. So I say I'm becoming increasingly convinced that the United States is Mystery Babylon. If the USA isn't Babylon, it is certainly the number one nation on earth today that looks like it. Time will tell whether it is the whore as foretold in Revelation 17. What we do know is that the nations of the earth get fed up with it and they burn it down. Revelation 17 says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Let me stop right there. Because I know some people are saying right now, Rick, okay, see, look, the U.S. can't be Mystery Babylon because the United States isn't drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ. Well, let me ask you. Have you have you asked have you made that statement in the Middle East right now? W- would you make that statement to the Iraqi Christians who have fled? Would you make that statement to the Syrian Christians who have fled? Would you make that statement to the Egyptian Christians? The Christians throughout the Middle East are b- bloodied and dying. They've been decapitated. They have been burned out of their churches and their homes. Why? Because of the U.S. under Barack Hussein Obama, 
The foreign policy is to aid and support and arm the Islamic Muslim radical jihad, which is killing the Christians. They are eradicating all Christianity out of the Middle East. Who do you think is responsible for the blood of the saints? And what about here? What do you think is going to happen here if Mr. Obama gets his way? His buddy Bill Ayers said decades ago that they knew that when they take control, and they have taken control, Bill Ayers' buddy, Barack Hussein Obama, is in the White House. And the White House and government agencies are stuffed with communist radical revolutionaries. They have taken control. But Bill Ayers said decades ago that when they, the communists in America, take control of of this United States, they knew there would be resistance. And perhaps 20-some million resistors, we would call them patriots, would have to be executed. Now that information came from an FBI informant. Larry Grathwald, who was on this program, he heard he heard it with his own ears. He was an informant inside Bill Harris' group. So they were talking decades ago about the need to eradicate the resistors. Now let me tell you something. If there is a financial collapse in this country, if there is a civil war in this country, Mr. Obama and the Obamanistas, the cult of Obama, and that's what we're dealing with. This is a religious cult that has taken control of the United States. It is a religious cult. The Obamanistas are not a political movement. It is a cult. Did you see the woman who fainted the other day standing behind Obama? That was fake. How did Mr. Obama know she was going to faint? The news headline said she, you know, Mr. Obama caught and and held, uh, supported a woman who was fainting. How did he know? He He wasn't looking at her. She was behind him. But right on cue, he turned to her as she was getting ready to faint. How did he know she was getting ready to faint? I'll tell you how. It was staged. He is a cult leader. It was a staged event. And I believe all the people in 2008 during the campaign who were fainting, those were those were plants. He was creating, he was deliberately creating the aura about him that when he walks into the room, people faint because of his great aura. He is a cult leader. He's a maniac. He's a madman. He's a psychopath. And if this country goes into civil war, if the U.S. dollar collapses, if there is some type of of civil disturbance in this country, I assure you that the cult of Obama will go into action to kill as many Christians as they can possibly kill. And the world will look on possibly for years while the bloodshed goes on. And you know what? The people in Europe and Asia and the South Pacific will see on television, on their TV news, they will hear about the Tea Party insurgents who blew up buildings in the United States, Tea Party insurgents who who attacked government forces loyal to President Obama. That's what they will see and hear on the news. And they will hear about Military forces loyal to President Obama putting down the insurrection. That's all they will see and hear, and that will go on for years. How many years has the genocide been going on in Sudan? The Christians have been killed by the millions in Sudan, and hardly anything has been done to stop it. The Christians are being killed in the Middle East. Nothing's being done to stop it. They're being killed in Nigeria. Nothing's being done to stop it. Same thing's going to happen here under the cult of Obama. The blood, the blood of the martyrs, the blood of the saints will be shed. 
by Babylon. So don't think that because that scripture doesn't make sense to you, like how could that apply to America? I'm telling you how it, it will apply. Well, let's get back to this, going back to this uh, Revelation chapter 17 and um, verse 7. But the angel said to me, why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition now the beast is the the world not I want to say the world government the beast is the government that seeks to dominate the world. The Bible doesn't predict a world government it predicts a beast government that seeks to dominate the world. The beast is not the antichrist the beast is not satan the beast is the government. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. The beast is the pre-flood government that existed before Noah's flood. It is the satanic Luciferian government. And that's why this government is called Babylon, because all of the hidden secret knowledge of the pre-flood world was kept in Babylon as they sought to resurrect the government that existed before God destroyed this world. That's another program. That's another topic. And all those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And it goes on, I want to get down to verse 10. The ten horns which you saw are the ten kings. And then verse 15, he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot. This is what I want you to see. These will hate the harlot. They will make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God has put into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Now, if the USA is indeed Babylon in the last days, we should keep in mind that Babylon is not destroyed until almost the very end. It is one of the last things that happens before the day of the Lord, when the Ancient of Days stands up to judge the nations and to give the kingdom to the saints of God. If that is the case, and if the U.S. is morphing into Babylon, as we see with its fanatical embrace of homosexuality, occultism, and idolatry, then this process will continue and accelerate for quite some time. The other option is, again, assuming that the USA is Babylon, the other option is that we are at the end of the age now, and that means the burning of Babylon is close on the horizon. I think each of us need to sincerely seek the Lord about this matter. And I say, don't let your heart be troubled. The important thing is not whether you are in Babylon. What matters is, is Babylon in you? That's what is important. And I say to you, to keep this in mind, the important thing is that the Holy Spirit does not find Babylon in you. This is the hour for all of God's people, Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant Christians, to come out of Babylon. God's people are in Babylon in the last days. He cries out to them. The great spiritual awakening that must happen soon is the realization that God's people are in Babylon, and Babylon is in God's people. They must come out of Babylon 
before the fire bur- falls, and they must get Babylon out of them. I'm Rick Wiles. This is True News. Currency Wars author Jim Rickards is next. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ, you're listening to True News, the end time newscast. This is Max McLean. How do we describe the Lord? Listen to the Bible from Jeremiah 10. God made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. When he thunders, the waters in the heavens roar. He makes clouds rise from the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with the rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. Every Goldsmith is shamed by his idols. His images are a fraud. They have no breath in them. They are worthless. The objects of mockery. When their judgment comes, they will perish. He who is the portion of Jacob is not like these. For he is the maker of all things. The Lord Almighty is his name. From Jeremiah 10. Listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. You're listening to True News, your commercial-free, listener-supported alternative global newscast. I'm Rick Wiles. The mega news story that the mainstream news media is ignoring is Saudi Arabia's intention to sever its decades-long special relationship with the United States. Saudi intelligence chief Prince Bandar bin Sultan invited Arab diplomats over the weekend to Jeddah to inform them that Saudi Arabia would be making a major shift in relations with America. Furthermore, Prince Turkey Al-Faisal publicly ridiculed Barack Obama's Middle East foreign policy blunders. Prince Bandar reportedly told European diplomats that Saudi Arabia will limit interaction with the United States. Sources familiar with the diplomatic rupture say it worsened when Barack Obama refused to assure King Abdullah that the United States would honor its commitment to defend Saudi oil fields if a Middle Eastern war erupted during an attack on Syria. If true, Mr. Obama has breached the covenant between the United States and Saudi Arabia that is the foundation of the U.S. petrodollar. The Saudi split comes a week after China's Xinhua News Agency published a blistering editorial calling for a new world order without the United States in front and center. In his best-selling book, Currency Wars, published in 2012, author Jim Rickards wrote that he foresees a series of black swan events that trigger a loss of confidence in the U.S. dollar, precipitating a rush to get out of the greenback. Are the Chinese editorial warning and the Saudi diplomatic rupture too of a series of black swan events that will trigger a loss of confidence in the dollar. Mr. Jim Rickards is on the telephone to answer my question. He is the Senior Managing Director of Tangent Capital. Mr. Rickards is a seasoned counselor, investment banker, and risk manager. He is also an advisor to the Director of National Intelligence and the Secretary of Defense. His next book is The Death of Money, The Coming Collapse of the International Monetary System. It will be released in April 2014. Mr. Rickards, welcome back to True News. Thank you, Rick. Nice to be with you. Yes, sir. Let's talk about this stunning rift between the United States and Saudi Arabia. Is it a black swan event? Well, it's a. Uh, it's certainly an indication. I think of the black swan events as the actual, you know, the the crash of markets or the uh, decline of confidence in the dollar or hyperinflation breaking out. Those are the black swans. But those things don't come out of nowhere. There are in intelligence analysis that we look for what are called indications and warnings. I actually, call it I N W. But you look for the indications and warnings in advance to know when the so-called black swan is coming. I think these are very, the the developments you talked about, Rick, I think are very significant, and uh, it's one of a number of things going on around the world. Certainly the Saudi, uh, the the breach of uh, the kind of very close relations with the Saudis and the United States is one of them, but we also see the Russians stockpiling gold. We see the Chinese stockpiling gold. Uh, We see other developments. We see the dollar getting weaker, the euro getting stronger. There are a lot of things going on around the world that are, uh, certainly if you're uh, a U.S. citizen, uh, should be very, uh, very troubling. Uh, regarding Saudi Arabia, are we witnessing the unraveling of the 1973 Nixon-Kissinger House of Saud deal? 
Um, potentially. And, and the thing about uh, Prince Bandar, I mean, he's the one you know you mentioned who's uh, uh, convened this uh, meeting in Jeddah. He is very, uh, shall we say, Americanized. I mean, yeah, he had a, ha- a house in uh, Aspen, Colorado. Uh, he was the Saudi ambassador to the United States for many years. Uh, very, very close uh, to the Bush family. So there is no, obviously no one in Saudi Arabia who knows America better and is more closely integrated with, you know, our values and our culture and our leadership than Prince Bandar. So the fact that he's the one making these announcements is no coincidence. He's sending a very sharp signal to the United States. And by the way, this has um, uh, obvious implications uh, along the lines you're mentioning, but less well-known is it really cuts off a lot of intelligence to the U.S. You know, we have great intelligence uh, professionals in in this country, but they can't be everywhere. And there are a lot of places that are very, very difficult to penetrate. I mean, you can't be, a, let's say, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed American walking around Tehran without attracting a lot of attention. So quite often, the way the intelligence services work, they share information. We, we come up with our, our specialty is satellite stuff because no one has a satellite network we have. So we might give satellite imaging to Saudi, and then they might give us what's called human or human intelligence from their sources. So if they cut that off, uh, that's going to kind of uh, partially blind us in terms of what's going on in the Arab world and the Persian world. Uh, Jim, in the Wall Street Journal and the London and Jerusalem newspapers, uh, the reports indicated that the Saudis are shopping for an alternative military defense ally. If so, will that be China or Russia? Uh, it would almost certainly be China. Bearing in mind that China's military capability is not that great, and their ability to project power around the world is not at all like the United States. But China's going to be their number one customer um, for oil on a going forward basis. It looks like the U.S. is getting very close to energy independence. We might not import any oil uh, sooner than later because of, you know, what's going on with uh, uh, fracking and natural gas uh, and oil fracking and so forth. So um, so they need someone to sell to. They'll probably be selling to the Chinese. They can't sell to the Russians because the Russians produce more oil than Saudi Arabia. Uh, it may be in terms of weapons systems, however. When they go shopping, the Russians have better military hardware. And, of course, the Saudis have been trained for decades by the United States, so they know how to use this stuff uh, better than uh, some of the other countries in the Middle East. But um, So it will probably be a blend. They, they might look for regional military alliances. The, the closest alliance right now is going to be between Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Um, and Egypt does have a very strong military. Saudi does, too, by the way. So uh, I think you'll see a regional uh, alignment between Egypt and Saudi Arabia. You'll see an economic alignment between Saudi Arabia and China. And Russia is a place where they'll be able to go shopping. That's how they would. Uh, but, but the bigger development, the one that you haven't mentioned, although I'm sure you're aware of it, is Saudi Arabia will now develop nuclear weapons. Um, because the real, the big play uh, is that, of course, Iran is on a path to nuclear weapons. It looks like the United States is not going to stop them. Israel may act alone, uh, but that's a very, very difficult task. And even if they have some success, it probably just buys time. So if it looks like the U.S. is going to allow Iran to obtain nuclear weapons, there's no way Saudi's going to sit there without a nuclear deterrent of its own. But they will get it from Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan are, are Sunni, um, sorry, they're, they're, they're Muslims, but they're very closely aligned with Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia's given them a lot of economic aid over the years. So, you know, they'll get their anti-aircraft from Russia, they'll sell their oil to China, they'll get their nukes from Pakistan, they'll get military support from Egypt. So it's a little bit of a patchwork, but, uh, but what they're saying to the world is, okay, United States, if you're, if you're not going to guarantee, uh, our, um, yeah, you know, the continuation of uh, of our regime, and we can't rely on you to stop the Iranians. In fact, we can't rely on you for anything. We'll just go our own way. So, if this is uh, the decoupling of of the Arab oil sales with the U.S. dollar, will there be a petro Chinese yuan or a petro Russian ruble, or is this the next step towards a global basket of currencies to replace the dollar? Yeah, that's a good question. I think we're heading for something uh, you might uh, call just ABD or anything but the dollar. In other words, we can speculate on a number of different global reserve currencies. Uh, I don't see the yuan uh, real. There's a lot of talk about the Chinese yuan as being the new global reserve currency. I don't see that at all. I don't see that for at least 10 years, probably longer, because to be a global reserve currency, you have to open up your capital account. You have to open up your markets. You need a lot of infrastructure that they simply don't have. And they don't have a rule of law. I mean, look what happened to Bo Lai. I mean, he just disappeared for a while. So the, the point being, no one wants to, to pile into a Chinese bond market that doesn't even exist yet. But there are other alternatives out there, and one of them could be... Um, 
that was what I call world money, uh, because it is world money. It's the uh, special drawing right, or the SDR, which is issued by the IMF. Now, it sounds very technical, and a lot of international economists will tell you it's very complicated, but the truth is it's not. Uh, the Fed has a printing press. They can print dollars. Uh, the Bank of Japan has a printing press. They can print yen. Well, the IMF has a printing press, too. They can print these SDRs, hand them out to their members. And I expect that's what we'll see as the new global reserve currency. So when the dollar gets run off the road, uh, it'll be by, uh, by SDRs. Now, whether that is ultimately successful is a separate question, but certainly the global elites, um, you know, the finance ministers, people at the IMF, uh, academics, um, heads of state, G20, and others are going to go for this SDR solution because it's really the only thing out there that can uh, replace the dollar that people might uh, might have some confidence in. But the, the IMF and the World Bank are part of the Western-controlled financial system, and it appears to me th- that the BRICS nations – are working to establish an alternative system, their own IMF, their own World Bank, their own SWIFT financial wire transfer system. So would they would they team up with the IMF, or are they just going to tell it to take a hike? Well, it's a very good question, Rick, and you're right. The, the BRICS have announced and are taking concrete steps in the direction of all of those things. They're, in effect, taking the post-war, the Bretton Woods international monetary system, and duplicating it with their own membership and on their own terms, uh, with themselves in control. That's not really what they want. What they want are more votes in the IMF. They want to see an IMF that looks a little bit more like the G20 or the United Nations General Assembly or even the United Nations Security Council. Now, right now, the United States uh, has a veto. Um, we cannot make things happen in the IMF, but we can stop anything we want. The rule of the IMF is you need an 85% vote to you know, amend the articles or do something significant. The U.S. has 16% of the votes, which means that all the other countries in the world combined can't get to 85% because we have 16%. So they, the Chinese would like to change that. They'd like to see the U.S. go below 15%, uh, and then their, their share would increase maybe to 5%. All this, by the way, is, is on the table. This has all been uh, sketched out, and it's awaiting approval, but the U.S. is blocking it. But So what, what the BRICS are really saying is, hey, IMF, We want to play by your rules, but we think it should be more fair. We think we should have more votes, and the U.S. should have fewer votes, so we'll no longer be dominated by the United States. And we're going to give you a chance to do that. But if you don't do it, we're going to go our own way and create our own institutions. So both things are are happening at once, but they they would prefer to work within the IMF, but only if they get the right amount of votes. Uh, Going back to Saudi Arabia, uh, they have something like $690 billion in U.S. Treasuries plus uh, billions invested in, in major U.S. banks. Uh, with this diplomatic rupture in place, uh, you, do you think there's any possibility that the Saudis are going to uh, play havoc with those treasuries? I don't see uh, anyone dumping those treasuries. Now, you're right, uh, Saudi has uh, about $690 billion. China has... Uh, upwards of two trillion. They have they have over three trillion in reserves, but about two trillion of that is in U.S. dollars, predominantly U.S. government securities. They can't dump them. Uh, I mean, they could try, but first of all, the market. This is the biggest market in the world, but even the treasury market is not that big. So they'd really be shooting themselves in the foot if they tried dumping them. You know, U.S. interest rates would skyrocket. Our economy would go into a depression. We wouldn't buy their stuff. And the value of their holdings would go down because, remember, you, you can't sell it all at once. So when you start selling a little bit and you trash the price, that reduces the value of what you have left. And so they'd be shooting themselves in the foot. But what they can do and what they are doing, in fact, at the margin, when they have new reserves, not the existing reserves, but the new reserves from their trade surpluses, from capital inflows and so forth, they don't have to buy more. And they can buy other things. They're investing heavily in Europe. They're buying stocks of companies. They're buying gold mines. They're buying physical gold, hard assets all over the world. So it's not so much dumping what they have as it is uh, buying new things with, with their increasing reserves. And that, that is showing up in uh, Treasury reports. That tre- the Treasury issues periodic reports on who owns what in terms of the, um, the Treasury market. And we're seeing holdings of Treasuries decline. Now, that would normally mean higher U.S. interest rates, except that the Fed is there making up the difference. In other words, if China buys less, the Fed buys more in these quantitative easing programs. So we haven't had the higher interest rates in the U.S. that you might expect, but we are seeing these major trading partners back away from the Treasury market, and that has huge implications down the road. Uh, Jim, how much funny money has the Fed printed 
since 2007? Well, the amount, uh, what they call base money, the technical name for it is M0, but base money, since 2007, at the start of the crisis, they had about $800 billion. Today, they have over $3.5 trillion. So they've printed $2.7 trillion of money. But, of course, they're printing another $85 billion a month, uh, which is over $1 trillion a year. So if we had this... Uh, we did this interview a year from now. The number would be 4.5 trillion, and by 2015, it would be over 5 trillion. So um, the answer is it's an enormous amount. Now, a lot of people say, "Well, that's bound to be inflationary," and I think at the end of the day, it is. But the fact is, we haven't seen that much inflation in the United States. And you got people like Paul Krugman, who say, "You know, see, I told you so. There's no problem printing money. We printed 2.7 trillion, and we didn't get any inflation." Let's, point to, let's print uh, $2.7 trillion more. Uh, what, what's missing in that analysis is that money supply by itself doesn't cause inflation. It takes two things. One is money supply, but the other one is you've got to spend it. It's called the technical name is velocity. You've got to get out there and spend the money. So I like to say it's like we're making a ham and cheese sandwich, and right now we've got the ham, but we don't have the cheese. But the cheese is behavioral. In other words, whether you and I and the listeners want to you know, keep our money in the bank and stay home and watch TV, or whether we want to go out shopping and you know, take our friends to dinner, those are really psychological states. And what the Fed's trying to do is to get us to kind of get into the spending mode. It's really hard, and it's not happening. But if it does happen, it can happen very quickly. The point is you can go along with very, very low inflation, even deflation, and then very suddenly the inflation can come out of nowhere because it won't be based on printing more money. It'll be based on a change in behavior, a loss of confidence in the dollar. It's exactly what happened in the 1970s. That inflation in the 70s, and by the way, between 1977 and 1981, cumulative inflation was 50%, 5-0. And so the, the purchasing power of the dollar was cut in half in just five years. Not, I'm not talking about going back to 1913. I'm talking about five years in the late 70s. But that took time to happen. That took 10 years uh, to build, starting in the late 60s with Johnson's uh, you know, guns and butter policy. So it can be slow to take off, but when it takes off, it can take off very quickly. And my concern is that a lot of... Uh, individuals and investors and people relying on, you know, annuities, insurance policies, retirement savings, and, and you know, bank accounts won't be ready for it. They'll just be taken by surprise. Uh, Jim, there there are things uh, that don't make sense to the average middle class person who's watching all these things taking place. One question that I get often uh, from listeners is, why do the markets go up every time the Fed increases QE or decide not to taper? You know, to the average person, it's like this is a bad sign. They're printing more money. You know, why are investors happy? Why are they euphoric about it? They should be scared out of their pants. So explain it. Sure. Well, first of all, let's let's think about who the investors are. They, these are not everyday citizens. Everyday Americans got badly burned in 2008. Many of them have not come back to the market. So what you're seeing are really professional traders, high-frequency trading, uh, and certainly institutions that have no choice but to invest in the stock market. So that's part of it. But the other part is that there's nothing Wall Street doesn't like about free money. If you give Wall Street free money, they'll bid up the price of assets because so much of it is done with leverage. Leverage means, you know, I'm going to buy some stock, but instead of doing it with real money, I'm going to do it with borrowed money. Well, if the cost of borrowing is zero, and that's what the Fed is providing, is zero cost of borrowing, I can buy a lot, a lot, certainly a lot more than if interest rates were higher. And actually, leverage ratios in what are called margin loans. A margin loan is just a, a kind of loan that brokers give you to buy stock. Those margin loans are getting close to all-time highs. So what we're seeing, that this is not a sign of a healthy economy. This is not a sign of fundamental growth. This is an asset bubble. It's no different than what happened in 1999, 2000 with tech stocks. It's no different than what happened before 2007 with the housing market. Um, it, it's, it's no different than what happened in 1929 with the stock market. It's another asset bubble. It will burst. When it bursts, it'll go down very quickly. You can see the stock market drop 30% in a matter of months. But it, it can go on for a long time. The funny thing about bubbles, they can go on longer than you think. And so it just feels good and, um, you know, gee. And then, it's, unfortunately, it's often the small investor who gets in at the worst possible time. They're like, gee, I've been watching this for four years. I haven't participated. Maybe I'm missing something. And they go out and buy stocks. And then, of course, they're the ones that get slammed when the, when the market crashes. So it's just another asset bubble. Uh, last week or so, uh, Mark Faber was asked, 
uh, what will be the next market bubble to burst? And he said, the United States. And uh, he said, we're the bubble. And uh, he speculated that the Fed could increase QE to a trillion dollars a month before this thing is over. Now, will it get that crazy? Well, uh, I don't know about a trillion dollars a month, but, but here's the point. I, I agree with Mark in, in one respect. Um, when he says the United States is the bubble, what he means is the dollar. And it was our, our whole economy is based on dollars, and I hear people say, oh, I've got a diversified portfolio. I've got stocks. I've got bonds. I've got real estate. I've got this and that. And my answer is yes, but it's all in dollars. And if the dollar collapses, you could be losing value across the board. And so... Um, that's really the risk. Uh, by the way, you don't have to get to a uh, trillion dollars a month, and maybe if you have hyperinflation, but but just going on the path the Fed's going, maybe even increasing these asset purchases a little bit to a hundred billion a month. There comes a time when when confidence is lost, and it can be lost very quickly. It's not like you you lose you know two percent confidence a year for fifty years. It's more like confidence is solid, and then one day it's not. That's the way markets actually work. And so I agree with Mark that uh, the whole U.S. is a bubble because we are undermining the value of our currency. We're taking steps to really ultimately destroy confidence in the currency. And when that collapses, it will happen very quickly. And this is why the Chinese are buying gold. You know, the Chinese are, you know, there's an old joke in banking. I'm sure you've heard it that, you know, if I owe you a million dollars, I have a problem. But if I owe you a billion dollars, you have a problem because you have to collect it. Well, we owe the Chinese, you know, several trillion dollars. So I would say the Chinese have a problem, not the United States. We could just print that money. And so they're trying to protect themselves. But as I said earlier, they can't dump the treasuries for reasons we discussed. But what they are doing is buying gold. And and what that gives you is gives you a hedge position. So now you've got a big pile of treasuries, you know, $2 trillion worth. But you've also got some number, because they're not transparent, but estimates are maybe three, four, five thousand tons of gold, uh, which is worth, uh, that'll be worth about $400 uh, billion. So here's what happens. If we maintain the value of the dollar, maybe gold doesn't go up a lot, but their treasuries are, are worth what we say they are. So the Chinese are happy with that. But if we trash the dollar by 10%, 10% they're going to lose um, you know, several hundred billion dollars on the portfolio, but that's going to take the price of gold up to $3,000 an ounce, so whatever they lose on the treasuries, they'll make it up on the gold. So, so they've got a hedge position. So they're, they're basically protecting themselves. Uh, and I tell individual investors, you can do the same thing as the Chinese. Don't go all in, but just put 10% of your portfolio in gold. Uh, you know, if you have $100,000, buy $10,000 worth. Or if you have a $1 million, buy $100,000 worth. And then the same thing, if, you're, if the value of your dollar assets is maintained, that's good. We all want that. But if the value of the dollar collapses, you'll make it up on the gold. So you're just you're putting yourself in a hedge position, and investors can do what the Chinese are doing. If the world is moving towards some form of gold-backed global currency, uh, how far will gold prices go in U.S. dollars before the system is implemented? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, one of the objections to any kind of gold monetary standard or the remonetization of gold, people say, well, you know what, it can never happen. You can't do it because there's not enough gold in the world. And that's nonsense. There's always enough gold in the world. The question is, what's the price? Now, at, say, $1,300 an ounce, which is about where it is today, there's not enough gold. But at $7,000 or $10,000 an ounce, there's plenty of gold. In other words, the same quantity of gold can support a large volu- larger volume of transactions at a higher price. And so you can't go, if you went to a gold standard at today's prices, it would be extremely deflationary. It would, it would be a worse depression than the Great Depression. So in order to do it, you're going to have to revalue gold upwards to, I think my estimate is the $7,000 to $10,000 an ounce range. So we may not see a gold standard, but if we do, or if countries have to go to gold to restore confidence, the price is going to be north of $7,000 an ounce because that's the only way it can work. That's the only uh, – you need that price level in order to support the, the banking system and global finance. If we have a, a gold-backed uh, global currency, will there be any logical purpose in owning physical gold after that system is implemented? Well, if you had a real gold standard that the governments um, enacted by law and we're willing to stick to – um, you might want to have some gold as a precaution, but you know basically there wouldn't be any particular reason to do it because uh, gold would just be fixed at that point. There would be no more 
you know, you wouldn't need the insurance anymore because um, they would have guaranteed the dollar with the gold itself. Uh, but until then, um, you very much need it. I, I tell people, uh, you know, don't wait until governments go to the gold standard. You can go on a personal gold standard today. All you need to do is take some of your cash and buy gold. Now you're on a gold standard, and, and that way you're protected against uh, whatever, you know, central banks might be up to. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in the run-up to a gold uh, currency, uh, at what point, where do you unload the majority of your physical gold? Well, in terms of where, I mean, pl- did you mean price or, or yes. just outlets? Yeah, you know, I think I think I wouldn't try to be too clever uh, in the sense that, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say I can pick a bottom, I can pick a top, I can tell you when to get in, when to get out. I think that's too much, and I don't I don't believe that. What what I focus on are the what's called the macro trends. I can see the direction. I know it's going much higher. I know it's going to play out over several years, not tomorrow. But this is not a 10-year forecast. I sort of would put this in the three- to five-year range. So the time to get some gold is right now because, actually, it's been knocked down quite a bit. It's, it's down 30% from the highs in August 2011. So this is a good entry point. Um, and, then, and then just stay with it. Uh, the thing is, if we go to a gold standard, you won't be disadvantaged by waiting because you'll always be able to sell it at that new um, you know, uh, fixed price. Uh, if we don't go to a gold standard, it's probably just going to get worse, and so you'll want to hold on to it. So I don't think investors have to be overly concerned about kind of when to get out. I mean, what, what you're really doing, I don't even think of gold as an investment. I think of it as money. Um, and if you want to have money, if you want to preserve wealth, have some gold, and it does the job. Um, the European Union is going to impose bank bail-ins effective 2016. That tells me we've got another wave of major bank uh, collapse is coming. Uh, any thoughts on this? Well, I mean, they, they may formalize that in 2016, but I say we we have bank balance today. Um, you know, certainly, if you even in the United States, if you have deposits above the insured deposit limit, you could lose in a bank failure. Um, you know, tomorrow. So that's that's always been part of the mix. Is people don't understand it, or they they think of bank deposits as you know kind of good as gold, or or at least guaranteed, and that's only true. Up to the up to the insurance limits. Now, um, I don't necessarily think um, you'll see you'll see some smaller banks um, uh, fail, and I think I would be particularly wary of banks in you know places obvious places like Greece, maybe Portugal, maybe Ireland to some extent. Certainly Malta, Cyprus. We, we already know the Cyprus story. Um, so some of that may be dangerous. As far as the core goes, you know, the bigger countries, Italy, Spain, Germany, France, those large banks, they're just too big to fail. So they might get in distress. You know, stockholders might be wiped out. But those banks are going to be propped up at, at the end of the day. But uh, you have to watch your insurance limits. I think uh, in the too big to fail banks, deposits up to the insurance limit will be protected. Um, but beyond that, I think you're at risk, absolutely. Do, do you see a confluence of, of events, trends, and cycles converging in, in the next few years where there's a focal point that we could have some really rough water? Yes, and I, I think that's a good good way to think about it. It's not just one thing that's going to somehow trigger a catastrophe. It's always a combination of things and a combination that you don't see coming. We can identify some of them. Certainly, um, you know, in the last four years, Russia has increased its gold reserves by 70%. Uh, China has increased its gold reserves by three or 400%. Uh, so you have to say to yourself, well, gee, are the Chinese dumb, or do they know something I don't? I don't think the Chinese are dumb, so that means they know something you don't, which means that they can see this collapse of the dollar coming. Um, but, you know, we've got other sort of ghosts in the machine. Look at these market crashes, you know, the, um, the night trading fiasco, the NASDAQ shutdown. Uh, there's something called the Syrian Electronic Army, which are basically Iranian hackers who are attacking our markets. So you've got financial warfare, you've got gold wars, you've got currency wars, uh, you, you've got you know an asset bubble in the stock market. All these things could come together. What really happens in the real world is that one thing leads to another. So maybe something starts out as a, a you know a stock market crash, turns into a liquidity crisis turns into some kind of announcement by Russia that they're no longer going to accept dollars and use some kind of gold-backed currency, and then exactly at the worst possible moment, Iran launches a cyber attack. So these you know, bad things tend to happen in bunches, and uh, you don't see it coming. So, yeah, I do think um, uh, investors need to be prepared for something like that. Uh, and, uh, of course, one way to do that is to have hard assets. It doesn't have to be gold. I mean, gold is, 
I think, the best, but you could have land, um, fine art, uh, you know, the farms, uh, income-producing land. Uh, there, there's some hedge funds that pursue macro and hard asset strategies. So there are a number of ways to protect yourself. Okay, one last question. Have you ever watched the movie, uh, it's a 1933 movie, Gabriel Over the White House? Gabriel at the White House, I don't think so. Ga- uh, Gabriel Over the White House, 1933, uh, screenplay written uh, by William uh, Randolph Hearst and the movie produced by Louis B. Mayer. And it's about a fascist takeover of the United States of America during a financial crisis. Well, you know what? You've piqued my interest, and I'll be sure to look for that. I've, that's my movie pick for the week. Okay, okay? thank you, Rick. All right. Jim Rickards, Currency Wars. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Biden. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is True News. Fear, doubt, or courage. Today's moment with Charles Stanley challenges believers to move forward even in the face of uncertainty. How in the world can you and I put our trust in, listen, the truth of God... If we're not going to trust in and to rely upon this God of truth. And if we say we love this God of truth, how can we neglect the truth of this God? Because what you and I know about him, we find in the word. He says, Joshua, if you want to know how to succeed in what you're doing, and if you want to accomplish your purpose, you must courageously obey me. Listen to what he said. He says, be strong and of a good courage. Be strong and of a good courage to do what? To do exactly what I tell you. You see, it takes courage to obey the Word of God. And when you're finding His will for your life and the Lord says, here's what I want you to do. Sometimes it takes pure courage to say, all right, God. And you may have to say, Lord, with great fear and trembling and doubt and frustration and anxiety and scared to death, the answer is yes. That's all right. He knows you are anyway. So there's no point in you saying, yes, God, no problem. Just hang it up there. (laughs) He knows when you and I obey him, even in our fears. He knows when we obey him, even we have questions and doubts. Listen, you say, well, should you never obey God as long as you have doubts? Forget it, friend. If God makes it clear, you do it. Your doubt may be in your capacity to do it, but don't doubt that God will enable you to do what he says. Well, all this news can be easily depressing and discouraging. That's why it's vitally important that we keep our eyes on the prize. And what is the prize? It is Jesus Christ. You know, if you listen to Christian radio or watch Christian TV, you could quickly get the impression that the prize is a little strip of land in the Middle East called political Israel, that it is the most important matter to God. It isn't. What is important to God are lost souls. If Jerusalem is so important in the last days, why does God call it Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified? And why does Jesus split the Mount of Olives in two from east to west? No, my friend, Jesus isn't coming back to save the land of Israel from the Arabs or the United Nations. He's coming back to destroy the wicked and to gather together the saints of God. The prize is Jesus Christ. The prize is eternity with him. The prize is the kingdom of God will be given to us. And as the news gets more depressing, you keep your eyes on the prize. Eternal life in New Jerusalem, not Old Jerusalem. The old city will be destroyed. New Jerusalem will be our eternal home on the new earth. Coffee. Coffee, no! 